All Fun and Games. Hi friends, season two of All Fun and Games is one of the truly great front men in music in Australia. Adam, how are you going, mate? Rav, I'm doing really well are you here. Excited? In the kilt. Uh, feeling good, actually. Yeah, I can tell you, mate, we've done nine apps. You are winning Best Dressed Award by a street. Do yeah. we get the basic instinct, Sharon Stone? Oh, uh, maybe by the end of the right. episode. We'll see we've how got, I go. I, I am a pretty demure kind of guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> don't give everything away too easy. <laughs> There's a, uh, I think we've got nine cameras on us here, mate. I don't know if we've yeah. got one sort of going up that angle, but we'll, we'll see. Have you played uh, Jenga before? Never ever played Jenga. Um, okay. I've heard about it and uh, played many games, but uh, right, eh? be interested to see what this one's all you about. Can, you can go first, mate. Now, because you have been on Hey Hey It's Saturday in your life, so I don't know where All Fun and Games fits in terms of the, um, <laughs> the, the pinnacle of your Jeez. visual media career. But we'll okay, get... um, well, look, all I've got to do is, I guess, is just pull one of these out. Pull right? one and of hope these it out. doesn't fall. Okay, let's, yeah. let's uh, oh man, see, I'm nervous straight away. Yeah. Peeps, this is, this don't is try this at home uh, without wearing a kilt, of course. There's there one down. We're underway. Yeah, looking good. Now, you are highly regarded within the industry, in, in outside the industry for that matter, as a genuine entertainer, right? Mm. What makes a good rock and roll front man? What makes a good rock and roll front man? Um, see, all my peers would probably disagree entirely with me uh, because everyone has their own, uh, their own field of pursuit that they want to do but uh, you know I, I think um, entertainment for me is the key and yeah. yes you've got to have great songs yes you've got to um, be able to sing you've got to be able to play as a band and you know that's that's almost a given but I've always had the ethos that every performance uh, should stand alone and people should walk away from it beautiful look at that mm. uh, should walk away from it going you know, that was one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. And, and, and I guess holistically, it, it's a, it's an, it was an entertaining night that I'll remember for that reason. Mm. It's funny, it just because we've, we've had the conversation before about those of us that end up with microphones in their hands, right? Which is generally, mm. we're extroverts by nature. We're confident and affable mm. and loving and all those sorts of things. But it's not always the case. You know, there are some cats that that person on stage is a character. But that bloke on stage is you, isn't it? Probably one of the best questions I've been asked since COVID, if not before. Right. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, for me, being an extrovert uh, is only a part of my life yeah. because there was a real uh, anomaly is not the right word. There's, there, ooh, see that? It's a little shaky. Um, oh, see something, something just popped out, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you believe it? Uh, it wasn't a kilt. No, no, it wasn't a kilt. Um, something just popped out and I think I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, there's probably a, uh, a misconception, is probably the best word, that uh, if you're an, ext you're an extroverted person, you're extroverted all the time. Mm. And, you know, even as far back as the 90s, the uh, Tasmanian cops used to be convinced every time I got up on stage that I should be drug tested because I was definitely on, you know, the highest barbiturate that they've ever seen on the Apple Isle. Uh, but reality was I wasn't, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I harnessed that for the show. Yeah. And then when I finish, uh, you know, I could literally go for a 10K run or I could go back and, you know, just watch an episode of Days of Our Lives or something. No, it's a balance. And I'm a classic Gemini. So my twin is the, uh, is the extrovert introvert. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, I, you know, I manifest it for the, for the moments I need it. But to balance myself out, and so I don't lose my uh, my mental health, then I've got to, you know, I've got to have the the quiet time and the and the the introverted time. Mm. It's interesting. We had a chat with Tim Rogers a couple of episodes ago. He said of quite a similar thing. And and Tim is um, probably a different sort of cat again, mm. and probably that example of an introvert by nature. But you know, he's very much saying that that time away is how you manage the time on stage. You know, and if you don't have that, yeah. yeah. Look, it's, it's kind of paramount. Now, I know you have a lot of sports people, you know, on the show, and mm. uh, it's kind of similar in a way for them where they've got to harness their physical energy for the game or for training. Mm. Um, but creatively, for me, are you feeling confident, by the way? Oh, as nervous as you are now. See, I I'm just wondering whether I should go right for the bottom. I'm going to. 
I'm going to make this a uh, little bit interesting right now. I'm going to take one from down below. So, sleight of hand. There it goes. Ooh. So now we're now we're getting a bit interesting. It Not is only in the conversation, but also in the, yeah. in the Jenga. Uh, was it your turn to speak on mine? Ah, look. We, we, the, oh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, you're I'm a bit scared. So, tell the, the music industry in Australia. I mean, chocolate starfish rose to initial prominence around the mid '90s. Mm -hmm. In those 25 years, you know, what what's changed the most? Do you think what's what's easier or harder or better or worse as far as the Australian music industry? Massive goes? question. Uh, to me, there are things that oh, are the same. See, this is really difficult actually speaking because I'm so engrossed in what you're about As are to the viewers, possibly. succeed in or fail in, which either way is fine. Look at that, kids. Uh, they say every once in a while you've just got to take the low hanging fruit, so I'm going to take it. Oh, yeah. from there. Uh, I think what's changed uh, is, uh, is obviously the, in the internet has changed the world in every, in every industry. Mm. So ours, ours aren't, uh, is no exception. So the things that we banked upon, like record sales and uh, being signed by a label and, you know, all those things back in the 90s and, and before that that were an integral part of what a band's um, life was. And we talk about those steps that, you, you know, you, if, you, if, I got the, if I got the deal, or if I got a um, great song, yeah. or, you know, it would all fall into place. Now there are, there are so few rules. So I don't think anyone really knows. We're all guessing. Yeah. on how to navigate it. Um, I still think what hasn't changed is a great band and a great uh, entertaining show and, and great songs will always um, be the cornerstone of, of people's um, desire to experience music. Yeah. Now, whether that's in a recorded format or whether it's in a live format, um, those things still have to be good. And you're always going to have, you know, and there are many more of today, there are many more... Um, uh, instant uh, success and instant die-offs. And I think with Starfish, just to round up that conversation, is that after more than 25 years, uh, we still have an integrity about us that, um, uh, that a lot of, uh, I guess, our peers within that, that age group, um, uh, when I say declining, I, I, and, I'm, and I'm not gonna point out any names here, but they're, they're, you can. they're accepting, they're accepting um, that they're on the the declining path of their career, so they don't take as many risks uh, in entertainment. They don't take as many risks in writing a new album or any, anything like that. That's going to be a little challenging for them uh, because, like everything, like our Jenga game, you can fail. Mm. Um, but that you can also create a moment of brilliance that that keeps you relevant, keeps you exciting, and that's if I can cornerstone one phrase that that's what I want every album every live show to be different from the last to be unpredictable um, to be a little edgy that you know and I'm sure Tim Rogers would agree with me on this that it has to be um, unique every time if mm. you're just going through the motions that's when you decline really quick yeah okay interesting I mean you one of the biggest parts in the change of the industry is obviously the business model is unrecognisable. From your first record, you sold a lot of compact discs, probably even a few cassettes. Yeah, so that's not how it works anymore. So, you know, what's chocolate stuff is you're making a new record right now? I'm not, do, do, do I have a scoop there? No, that is a scoop. That is a scoop. Well, I've got a, we're yeah, finally after, the well, it took till season two and we got a scoop. But why make a record now? I mean, you have just half answered that question with the previous. But yeah, because, I, okay, I, I sort of have half answered it, but you've got to weigh up, uh, you know, financially, will we make... Yeah. Oh, I don't know, I don't... Yeah, I don't know, I, 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 got, I don't have many where it to go. So, it is so shaky. You've got to weigh up... Um, obviously, financially, you may not make a lot, uh, but it's almost, almost like a business card or an updated business card. Ooh. Or an updated image, right? Mm. Um, all of a sudden, once you and I've always believed this: once you've got people's attention, and if you're looking purely as a as a marketer here, once you've yeah. got their attention, then you can at least have an even chance of selling them something. Yeah. If you don't have their attention, um, you've pretty much got jack. 
Yeah. So the new record uh, reminds our core fans, which um, I'm going to talk about that um, gradual decline. We've, we've actually elevated our fan base in the last th three to four years uh, by, by three. So we're three times our fan base. That's incredible. It is incredible. Whereas most others are, you know, managing only minor additions to, to the well, if you like. Yeah. And, and I think that's because we've taken um, some uh, astute um, decisions in our... Gee, that's a segue into your next move, isn't it? Astute decisions, right. Now. Uh, in our... Hopefully your next record doesn't fall like this tower's yeah, about to, mate. No, not right. I but that's... Yeah, I mean... Sorry. Oh, no, look, I, I think... Pregnant pause right here, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, say men can't multitask. Well, I believe I just about have. I reckon you've won this game. No, no, day it ain't over but, uh, but until the fat uh, lady uh, sings. The you make uh, uh, it raises a great question about how there has been a resurgence of the Heritage Act in Australia to a degree, particularly live. Now, it's probably a bit demeaning to put chocolate starfish in that category, given you you're probably not old enough to to fit into it. But there's a real section of a large section of artists that say maybe 88 through 95 were very prominent. They fell away, they couldn't buy themselves a gig, and then they came back. Yep. Chocolate Starfish may have done a bit of that to a degree. And if, right, so how did you get back? You know, what, what were the specific things that you did? Yeah. What are the lessons? Well, I don't know whether you were aware, but I walked away from the band in about 98 uh, to about mm, 2000 and so oh. I walked away for about seven years. Yeah. And How come? Um, oh, how come? The, the simple answer is, uh, personally, I wanted to understand the complexity of um, who I was as a person. So, uh, yes, I wanted to make a solo album, which I did, reconnected, but it was more than that. It was it was more the, the complexity of who I am as a, as a, as a human being and a soul on this earth. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I was, you know, as, as much as I was a good entertainer, I knew there was more to me. And when you're only in one realm uh, daily, you, you can't explore those other parts. And I just, I was so desperate to explore altruism, you know, by helping people. I was so desperate to explore, you know, how I could be as a, as a public speaker, how I could be as a presenter, uh, how I could... Um, I guess, you know, work with kids, which I do in, in my Museo Magic program. Um, so I wanted to explore those things. And when you're part of a, you know, like your sports people will, will adhere to, when you're part of a team, it's very difficult to step outside without either offending or, or you know, or, to, or being opposite to what the band or the, or the team wants. So mm. I needed to do that. Mm. And, you know, at the time it probably boys weren't happy about it and but we've sort of looked at it now with hindsight and gone as, as much as it was probably too long uh, yeah. what was good about it was that we, we're now back with a fresh perspective on each other and I've got more things that I can offer to the table and I think that's important yeah but you've created add-ons as well I mean I think you know, a couple of the lessons certainly for chocolate starfish were yeah. you created additions to your product you know. Yeah, and they were, the, they were those risks. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the classic album series that we've done with uh, Bat Out of Hell and Meatloaf, we've done yeah. the Incest Kick, and, and I was right in the middle of, um, you know, a solo tour of Bohemian Rhapsody, which was yeah. some of the biggest, which I know you were at uh, the very first show we did, and was some of the biggest numbers that either myself or the band ever mm. played. And I think that's just being really smart, but also you've got to deliver. Amen. Right? Yeah. So yeah, you can say, I can do this or I can do this, but if you don't deliver, uh, you're gonna take fans away. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's, that, that we've been smart about. Um, you know, keeping on recording is, is, a, is a, smart, a smart move because uh, it, it satisfies the, the, the fan base, but also when you, you, know, when you get you know, a lot of young kids come and watch me do Bohemian Rhapsody, for example, that love that movie, because they're the Spotify generation, they're on. Adam Thompson, Chocolate Starfish, then yeah. they're listening to your stuff. So yeah. all that does is grow everything about you. Yeah. And that's got to, it's got, you've got to have a growth mindset. Yeah. 
You, the, the two takeaways in terms of a lesson or at least a reminder, regardless of where you're at in the industry, the first is adaption and that you found little add-ons, you know, to basically keep yourself on work. And yeah, and look, and we've all sung living on a prayer more times than we probably want to to pay our rent, right? But um, the other thing is you just, you've also got to make it good. And certainly working with you with the Bohemian Rhapsody stuff, it's fucking great, like it's world class. And what we know is that getting people off the couch was already difficult. We don't know what that's going to look like in 2021, right? Mm. We don't know how the consumer will behave. We, all we know is that we don't know. Yep. But if you're creating an entertainment product that demands people leave their house and pay their $60, then that's what you did. And that's, I think that's the lesson for the younger player in terms of the, the, the resurgence of an act like Chocolate Starfish and how you managed to do it. The first thing you did is you made it really, actually really, really good, yeah. as well as adapting. Correct. And you know. if, you, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the Michael Jordan philosophy of the, of the 10,000 hours, yeah. you've got to spend on anything. I think that's, um, that's a challenge for a lot of young crew because yeah. um, they're instant gratif they've been brought up instant gratification yeah. feeling. So they think, right, if I want that, I get that. Yeah. If, I want, if I want to have a record deal, I write a song and then I'm in. Yeah. Right? Or I line up at a singing competition. And up, yeah, mm. that's another whole story, which I'm sure mm. we'll get into. Um, but, you know, you've, to be good, you've just got to put time into yeah. things. And you've actually got to know when to take calculated risks. You've actually got to know how to peripherally, it's a big word for this time of the day, read a room. Yeah. And you can't, I mean, the boys get so frustrated in Starfish with me, but. You know, we've got a set list of whatever it might be, and the first two songs are a given, but after that, I read yeah. the room. Yeah. And if I think they need song X here, yeah. I've got to live and die by that decision. Yeah. And you're the man with the mic, you make that decision. That's, yeah. you know, and the best people that do it can read that room and do it. But, but, but you, only, you only get that from experience, and I think that's where you're coming back to your 10,000 hours. And that's the thing that worries me about the music industry in Australia, in that, and certainly from my perspective, and I'm not saying I'm a good singer now or ever was, but I was awful, but I did a million gigs, a gig after gig, and I had that platform. Yes. And that's a lot harder, because yeah. you can only get good by doing gigs you can in only the end. Good by it, and the same as and, and Yeah, and that's where, at least doing gigs, if, if you're an 18 year old kid, and you want to do your four gigs a week, you know, it's a lot, lot harder now. And th that's, that's where the challenge yeah. so is and, can, and is going to be. While you're making your move, if I can segue now in, in, into songwriting for the very same reasons, I mean, we ooh, didn't see that one coming. It's a bit like the Twins game, but if you all haven't watched it, watch it on Netflix. It's, it's, it's a game of chess, but it's uh, kind of similar. I'm going to pull out all guns here. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit like songwriting. Oh, that, oh the kilt. Yeah, we'll get a rear shot of that oh, kilt there, mate. Uh, Got to look this for a new angle. Um, I, reckon I, I reckon I've got the one here that needs to come out. Ooh. Uh. No, I'm going. <laughs> See? Okay. I believe that. I'm not looking up your kilt there, by the way. I was looking at the game. Oh, jeez Louise. This is really difficult. Um, I believe that. I got it. Um, wow. Where, was, where are we up to? Yeah, I, look, I, I don't know. I, uh, I was looking up your kilt. No, so I was going to say songwriting. So, Zoran was my songwriter uh, partner back in the 90s with Starfish, and we had a real connection on push and pull. And the, uh, which is in songwriting, it's, when you're collaborating, it's a really interesting, you can be the Tim Finn, sorry, Neil Finn type, where uh, you are the master and everyone else just plays what you say. But when you're collaborating, there's there's a an interesting push and pull that doesn't happen with every writer. And Zora and I had it. Tim Henwood and I are doing it at the moment with uh, this new album, Tim from the Super Jesus uh, and uh, and Rogue Traders. So he's written a lot of good songs. But we're still learning when and how to push each other and. Um, you know, is that good enough? And yeah. and even after ten attempts at a melody or a, or a lyric, you know, you have to suck it up and go, no, it's not right. Yeah. But how do I tell him after the tenth time? Yeah. Like, sure. And or vice versa. Yeah. So yeah, you know, the industry, and we talk that goes back to the ten thousand hours thing. It's 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 trial and error. But as long as you learn from your your trial, and not just keep repeating the same mistakes. Um, then uh, ultimately some great stuff 
it emerges. And I'm, this, this album, which is yet untitled, is some of the best stuff that, that I know I've ever written. And it's, wow, um, awesome. And I, and I can say it sort of harks back um, in some ways to the first album where that was the collaboration with Zorin, but it was a collaboration of, of several years of being time free enough to reflect and spend time on songs yeah. and not just you know a quick throw of a melody here and oh, now I've now got to get off to do a gig or now I've got to get off and do this. Yeah. The one beautiful thing that the pandemic has offered is is that opportunity, like I was 24 again, to be able to look back at all the music and go, right, what do I need to do to this to make it great? And I can spend weeks on a song, yeah, and then at the end just go, wow, it happened. Yeah, great. Yeah, or weeks on a line sometimes. Weeks on a line. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. it's always it's that thing where the first 95 percent is easy and the last five percent takes forever. Yes. Yeah. It, no, it certainly does. And 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 just you know having that fresh oh man why are my things taking yeah. a little a little longer um all right so i'm just gonna take a little risk here that's a big risk oh Yay! people it's all over brother shouting thank you very much at least oh, i yeah. uh, well i've lost the, i've lost the jenga you lost jenga yeah I, that's uh, good hu i humbly acquiesce to your thank brilliance. you yeah no it's yeah, it's good yeah brilliance brilliance might be a strong word the singing competitions on tv we touched on that for a minute sound like you have an opinion on it Look, it's the reason why I put together my uh, Museo Magic program for, yeah. for kids because the very first uh, reality TV show I saw, being the being the Idol one, they you know they had the uh, the preamble blooper reel that they were trying to sucker all the fan base in on, and mm. you know there were kids crying and there were there was just it was I actually felt it it was humiliating in many ways to. Uh, to human to human beings, and and the one thing that struck me when I when I saw it, and and I've, look, I've tried to watch a couple of episodes, but it's, um, it's a competition, and I, and I don't feel that creativity, in its essence, is a, is uh, is a competition that mm. should be measured because, as we've just discussed, um, there are some days when you might only write one line, and, mm. but, you're still progressing towards something. Right, yeah. and um, if you always feel like you're under the microscope or you're getting measured by um, a supreme power, which I'll use that word really, uh, mm. really delicately, um, people that believe they've got the answer to your success, then um, you know, then, then you're going to build up these these paranoias, or worse, you're going to homogenise yourself into this really narrow band of yeah. acceptability yes. just to succeed, right? And yeah. I think so many of those idle kids, unfortunately, uh, you know, mimic and copy and, and um, talk the talk, walk the walk, whatever, whichever way you want to dice it up, yeah. so they'll get signed or so they'll get um, accepted into the top 10 or top 20. And I always use the analogy that if Bob Dylan went on one of those shows, wouldn't make it past the first round unless, of course, he had parents that uh, divorced when he was five and he uh, had debilitating injury that he had to overcome because then his backstory would be worth listening to. Yeah. Look, it, yeah, you're spot on. And it's good for a certain type of artist, but it's not probably good for everyone else. No, yeah. and, and, look, we, and this is where I, I have to stand for what I believe in. And that's, yeah. and that's why I created Museo Magic because I, I wanted a... a process that even if you've never done anything creative in your life or, you, or you've never um, had the courage to do it, you can collaborate with a group of people on, a, on, a, on a, you know, a social issue or a school anthem or whatever it might be, that your input is as valid as the next person's. Yeah. And then collaboratively we come up with this thing that, um, that we all feel represents us. And, and I think part of that negotiation as a as a group so is a really cool thing. And it's not about being the best. It's never about that. Yeah. It's about what can I contribute today to not only empower myself, but also empower the, uh, the collective whole. Because Museo Magic has gone, I mean, you've gone far and wide with that, haven't you? We have. We, uh, you know, we have a, a TV show called Outback Tracks from the last 15 years we've done in uh, Aboriginal communities. So we've got yeah. two seasons of that on SBS, NITV. And, uh, in India, we do. In fact, the Indian uh, 
the economy got me through uh, COVID mostly. Is that uh, right? Yeah, okay. Doing a lot of uh, a lot of companies working from home wanted to keep their uh, employees engaged, so we created these online anthems that they had to co-collaborate on that was around their values and around writing them as a song and describing them and, and into a into a livable um, product, if you like. That wasn't just a mission statement of, of seven words that no one, uh, or lines that no one really believes in or understands how they live. Yeah. Uh, once you reframe them into lyric and they become a song, then that you created, you weren't told to believe this, that's when you have attachment to things. Mm. That's, when you, that's when you feel it. Yeah. So, yeah, so we've got a, um, you know, a, a music centre in Mumbai and um, all done as a very small charity. So we've yeah, right. done well. If people want to look that up, where, where should they go? Uh, it's, so that's uh, Musicama. So M-U-S-I-K-A-R-M-A. Okay. Yeah, so it's just, awesome. um, it's just playing it forward for the greater good. Yeah, awesome. When we have, particularly with our sporting talent, and the men's mental health issue is, it's on the agenda everywhere, but it's something that mm. comes up, particularly on this platform and the live stuff that we do for the speaking events, and which is a great thing. Meditation is a thing or a conversation that is amongst that a bit. You're a meditator, is that the noun? <laughs> yeah, you're a, a you're a meditator? Um, yeah, I am actually. And uh, that's been a bit of a, a saviour for me. Um, I, at, well, developed, if you like, um, mental health at about, 40s, about 15 years ago. Did you really? Yeah. 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 How, it's so common, isn't it? Do you know why? Do you know why? Well, after lots of, you know, research into myself and, and lots of therapeutic um, uh, things that I've done with everything from psychologists to, to Reiki masters to my guru in India who I go to, um, to do a deep breathing uh, course. Um, why it happened, for me personally, it was, be it was because I, I had family tragedy when I was in my teenage years. My, my mum died when I was uh, 15 and then my sister died when I was 17. So um, that's a pretty profound, uh, I guess, change in life. And mm. I sort of felt I'd, I dealt with it as a good country boy, you know, by yeah. getting on with life and, and getting into my sport. And then, and then I found music and, and you know, pretty much ran away to the circus, if you like, for, yeah. for, for 10 or 15 years. And when, you know, Starfish kind of peed out, so it was, a, yeah, it was around about 2000, or just before 2000. And, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I had a, a bit of a, a night where I, where I didn't sleep, and that became my manifest of, um, of fear mm. uh, that I was going to, I was going to die. So, yeah. Um, and so I, I couldn't run away from it anymore, and so I had to get help. And uh, obviously, the, everything from medication, like I said, to therapists, to um, to meditation, which um, I, I believe is is one of the most important things in my in my toolkit. So yeah. I think if anyone just believes that a quick fix of a pill or or, or a, even a cognitive therapy is going to help them, it will. But um, I think you've got to have a wide toolkit. Mm. And for me, the meditation's a big part of it. So that, uh, you know, I meditate before I go on stage now. Um, so okay. I don't go too over the top, actually. Is that right? Yeah, wow. I do. And I where, do. how do you do that in a, where do you find a spot in a dressing room? <laughs> oh, so having been backstage <laughs> with Chocolate <laughs> Savage before. Yeah, no, I, look, when I say just, so it's not just before, so I'd say probably an hour before. Okay. Uh, I would, in my hotel room, before I come to the, the venue, I will do a meditation and, uh, I guess it just evens out my, my temperament. We talked at the very start of the interview about the, um, the extrovert introvert, you yeah. know. Um, my, you know, for me, I, I can be 11 plus, as, mm. you, as you've seen on stage. So if I hit the stage um, at eight, level eight, and let the audience take me to 10 or yeah. 11, that's fine. But if I hit the stage at 11, I may not sleep for a week after. Yes, that. okay. So I've got to balance it, and yeah. but I love it. It's just it's such a such a pure and beautiful and simple thing to do that um, you know people say it's difficult and they can't meditate. But go back to the ten thousand hours once you've once you've done a few, and I'm talking mm. you know years of it. Uh, 
then you, you get into the, the habit and the swing and it, and it just becomes a, real, a part of, of who you are. It's interesting that you, that you said 40 because a lot of times in these conversations and there are a lot of men that, and mate, you say you ran away to the circus and then maybe that was, your, that was a pretty good distraction for a while. But, yeah. uh, you know, I know a lot of men that in their 20s and 30s at least feel like they're in control of their lives and things, and then somewhere in those 40s they feel like they're not in control. A lot of things happen young, b between young kids and the, yeah. this whole crisis of masculinity that, that's interesting. But yeah, the meditation, w what's your advice for a bozo like me who's tried it and failed miserably? Uh, maybe the person who taught you was not the one for you. Okay. Right. So it's that simple. Um, it's like singing teachers, right? Yeah. You might have, you might have gone to three or four, right? And the first three didn't quite work for you. But all of a sudden, you found one that you resonated with, who had a technique that was right for you. Um, meditation, like all things, is not um, is not copy uh, copy copy co cookie cutter. It's. Yeah. Uh, it's different. Um, the guru in, in India has a process called the art of living, and it's beautiful. It's, okay. It's a, it's a it's a breathing and meditation process that, whenever I feel like I'm out of control, uh, I just yeah I can just go in and do it, mm. and it brings me back to base level. So that's the first thing I, I would suggest to you. But I do want to touch on your toxic masculinity. Um, mm. I think that's that's the greatest um, challenge for men. Uh, of, I think all ages, and and uh, you know even even young men today, it's um, it's generational, so it gets passed down. So even you know you've got, have you got a son? Seven. Right there you go. So who you are today, Rav, and the choices you make, will set your seven-year-old up for um, how free he is to uh, break away from that toxic masculinity, mm. or. Um, or to be imprinted on his DNA in such a way that he may never break out of it. So yeah. the, even at your age, the responsibility uh, is still really important, not only for yourself, but oh, for the next generation. It's enormous. I'm very present to it. I'm just not sure whether I'm doing it right or not. When, when you say toxic masculinity, I mean, what, what is, you know, does that mean that we're taught to be tough and, and we're yeah. meant to, you know, is that what it's, that means? To me, toxic masculinity is, is simply what we believe we should be, right? Right. And there's an interesting parallel <coughs> with finding yourself as a, as a entertainer. Um, there's the, um, the stereotypical entertainer which you think you should be yeah. versus, versus finding who you are. Mm. And that's the same as, as being you know, a, a fella. So girls, stick with us on this just for the next minute because it's important <laughs> and it might help you with your, your partner. Um, we have a, a way that we believe we should be and that, and that is by reading our, our peers, it's by reading our... Uh, our parent, you know, our, our dad or our granddad, and to make changes um, in your life that are opposite to the way they taught you takes immense courage. Yeah. Immense courage. Like even even with the stuff that happened to me as a teenager, um, dad didn't know how to tell me he loved me. Like mm. he, he couldn't verbalize, like the Fonz. Remember that episode yeah, yeah, yeah. of Happy Days where Fonz couldn't say the word love? Dad couldn't say it. Mm. And I kept said to him a couple of times with no, on the phone with no answer. And then the third time I said it, I'm just about to hang up the phone and, he, and I hear this, love you. I went, <laughs> so of course I bawled my eyes out. Yeah, wow. Right? Yeah, but wow. then the channel was open yeah. and I can't shut him up now. Right. He hugs me, he tells me, Daily, he loves me. Right? Yeah, but how great! But how great! Yeah, but it is. But when I say toxic, it, it's toxic because you know it's it's learned behaviour. That's yeah. it's that simple, and, and you can unlearn it, but you've got to practice it. You've got to mm. practice what you preach. There's a song called "Call Me Out" on the on the on the album, and okay. Darren, our drummer, and I were talking about it the other day, and uh, and part of that is is. In this song, is, is talk, you know, calling things out when uh, when you know they're wrong, and um, but amongst your your peer group, when it's gonna risk them alienating you, mm. even at our age. Oh, it's speaking your truth. It's the hardest speaking, thing of all. It's the hardest thing of all. So yeah, and and in your relationships, and you know, say with with your partner, with all that stuff, speaking your truth is that's the hardest thing of all. It is, and it's consistently, and not, and not changing who you are, depending upon the, um, 
the group that you're with that day. So not yeah. being one face for the boys, yeah. uh, you know, one face for your wife, one face for your kids. Consistency is the one thing that will elevate you quicker to enlightenment. Yeah. The two things that stick out there that stick out with a lot of the, the conversations we have around it is, you know, obviously, you know, it is really hard if you feel that you need to break from it, by the way, you know, but, mm -hmm. but it, the vigilance, that vigilance with yourself, um, whether that be through making sure you meditate or whatever it is you found that is going to help you or alleviate you, all those, you know, it, vigilance is a real uh, a theme that keeps coming up, I think, in these conversations, is yeah, that totally. you're just really present to yourself and continuing and to... And I think being kind enough to yourself to go, okay, well, I have meditated for a month now, doesn't mean I'm a failure, doesn't mean I'm, I'm shit, yeah. right? I do want to do it, yeah. right? Don't, don't just, you know, don't be, and a lot of blokes are all or nothing, right? Yeah. I'm either, I'm either on it, on, off the beers or I'm on the beers, yes. right? Right, so it doesn't need to be that black and white. In fact, if mm. we're less black and white and we're more uh, kinder to ourselves, more shades of grey, uh, we can, you know, we can, fo we can flow like the, like the mountain and the river. There's my analogy for the day. Yeah. Our song. Yeah. There is a song about it. There I is. Believe, yeah. You might That's find it on a cassette somewhere. Well, you may. You know what, this wasn't, uh, hey, hey, it's Saturday. You know, Look, it I, doesn't need to be. I, I um, really do appreciate you being on All Fun and Games, mate, and it is always just wonderful to have a chat to you. No, it's, it's been great, and I, I need to finish with uh, camera. What, what camera are we calling this? You, you're the rock star, mate. You pick your, I think, is this camera one? Camera one. All right, camera one. <clears throat> this is my basic instinct moment, right? Sharon Stone, <laughs> beat your heart out, baby. I expect you to slow that down in the edit so that everyone gets a schnicko look. Namaste. See you later. <laughs>